Funding for Curate, the Arizona Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society member Eleanor Light and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on 8. For more information, call 602-496-8888. And now, an 8th special presentation. This time on Art Beat Nation. A photographer focuses a lens on his heritage. Most people will look at the images and try to connect them to reality. And I think that's a mistake. The surreal depictions of one artist's obsession. There are somewhat of this world, but then twisted and somewhat not of this world. Elaborate paintings on an unusual canvas. And the first time I saw the dye hit the silk, I was in love. I fell hard. Meet an artist turning tin cans into works of art and acts of human kindness. The more I cook and feed, the more material I have to make can art, the more I can sell to buy more food to feed more people, to buy more cans to get more money to feed more people. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. Photographer Steve Sabella was born in Jerusalem, and his work often focuses on his Palestinian identity. Recently at the PhotoFest 2014 Biennial in Houston, Sabella's work was front and center as part of an exhibition of contemporary Arab photography. Here's a look. Most people will look at the images and try to connect them to reality. And I think that's a mistake. We need to look at the image itself and see how it tries to communicate with us. up in Jerusalem under Israeli occupation. It took me 38 years to free my imagination from the Israeli occupation in Jerusalem. It's not an easy life. Most people think they are, when they are under occupation, it's only physical. I found that it's not only physical, it's mental. So I grew up living in mental exile in Jerusalem. And I had to suffer a lot from this. So I needed to cleanse my system from the, this occupation. And once I did, I went back on track to decode what it means to live in this world. When I left Jerusalem, I felt completely in exile, in a state of alienation. In London, living in that hybrid city, it intensified my feeling of alienation. So I did Windows for two reasons. First of all, you look from inside, outside, and how the world looks at me. But I felt completely out of place. I neither belonged here or there. So I questioned my belonging. Where do I belong? Usually I deal with Windows, but in Metamorphosis, I dealt with barbed wire. I stitched my wounds with barbed wire and they became an organic extension of my body. And once I did that, I became very strong. I freed myself. If you look at this image there, you can see the wall, a reflection of the wall in water. It looks concrete, but look very carefully. It's liquefying, it's dissolving. And this is how I started to free myself. But notice something, it's all done in the imagination. So there is the power of the mind that can achieve freedom. I have a show in London, a retro retrospective show. I took out all text. I even took out the titles of the works. So I wanted the spectator to enter the gallery space to go through a visual journey. 
They understood everything I needed to say without me saying it. Most galleries, they start with text. No, let's go back. Let's start with the image itself. And if there is text, it's secondary to the understanding and appreciation of art. If I look at my art, I see I was going through a process of uh, finding my own freedom or reclaiming myself. And I see my work is about consciousness. If we manage to convince ourselves that we are free, we are a free people. To find out more about Sabella's work, visit photofest.org. Dayton, Ohio painter Amy Kohler Anderson's medium of choice is acrylics. Her paintings depict narratives about obsession, duality, and containment in an exploration of the differences of being in and out of control. Our next segment takes us inside the artist's studio. I've heard a variety of ways my work is described. Some people say that it's scary, <laughs> which I don't agree with. There tends to be a little bit of a dark edge to a lot of my compositions. Some people say whimsical, playful, colorful, surreal. They are somewhat of this world, but then twisted and somewhat not of this world. Working from a studio in a Riverside home, Amy Kolar Anderson uses a paintbrush to bring to life people and places that seem familiar but also contain elements of the unknown, the bizarre, the alien. I've always been an artist, was always a creative kid. I did attend the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, but I feel that my, most of my training has come from researching other artists, talking to other artists, um, experimenting. I learned with oils, but the slow dry time, all the toxic solvents, they just weren't my favorites. With acrylics, you don't have any of that. You know, I can do a layer of paint and within 10 minutes, I'm working on top of it as opposed to 24 hours with the oils. Acrylics also have all sorts of mediums. There's interference paints, metallics, neons, just a lot of the crazy textures and colors that I like to play with. In addition to her playful use of color and materials, Amy uses her canvases to create characters and tell stories, finding inspiration in a variety of places. There's always these layers of narration and character development and such. One of my recent series was based on the writings of Lewis Carroll and his Alice in Wonderland books. And so I read the books, researched the characters, and created drawings that I then transferred to the canvas. It was a lot of preparation, a lot of pre-planning. And then sometimes I'm inspired by dreams, sometimes working in the yard, I'll get an idea of sometimes life events or stories on the news. Inspiration can come from anywhere, and I like that variety. I don't want to just make the same thing all the time. I like the challenge of new directions and new materials. As far as completing a painting, it takes anywhere from Oh gosh, 50 hours to 200 hours, depending on the size and the level of complexity. I do have a YouTube channel. I've been posting time-lapse videos. I've learned through trial and error to set up the camera and the timer goes off every minute. So I've had a lot of fun playing with time in there, whether it's showing parts of the window in the frame or showing my cats flipping and flopping as they sleep or showing clocks tick away the minutes. It actually helps the paintings move a little bit quicker, even, which is strange, because <laughs> it just keeps me focused. <laughs> Amy's paintings have been exhibited in galleries and juried shows throughout Ohio and across the United States. In the winter of 2014, she created a series of entirely new works for identification, a solo show at Art Street Studio D Gallery on the University of Dayton campus. I was asked by Brian LaDuca, the director of Art Street, to participate. This year's theme in general was on human rights. So Brian and I talked about what directions the show could take. And that's when I decided I wanted my show to be about empathy and just connecting with other people. There were six paintings in the show, and those were more of the internal sort of looking inward. 
The palette was also very, very different from what I've normally done. My work had been very loud and in some cases a little obnoxious, a little flashy. And this work was very quiet and soft, lots of grays and muted blues and silvers. So it was just, just a lot quieter. There were two face panels on either side of the gallery space. And I had the faces of family members, loved ones, friends, people that I've had really great conversations with. Basically, the faces would transition down into pebbles, and then the pebbles would go across the floor. The pebbles represented sort of the nameless, faceless other. And as they transitioned into the people that you know and love, they go from being these elements that you can ignore and pretend aren't there to elements that you're, you would do anything for. So in the center of the gallery, we had the interactive workstation, and I created these canvas pebbles that people could draw or write on, any sort of situation where they've learned empathy or whatever they wanted to talk about that tied into that idea with connecting with others. So it was really exciting to see the piece evolve throughout the month and see these pebbles multiply, and they were able to sort of shift and turn and just sort of dance in the space. It was very meditative, and I really enjoyed how it came together. Originally a native of the Chicago area, Amy moved to Dayton in the 1990s. Since then, she's developed strong ties within the local art scene and now finds herself playing a special role for a company that's part of the city's reinvention. Dayton has been growing and changing over the last 18 years. Warped Wing Brewery is one of the newest breweries in town. I'm considered their official brewery artist and I do all the specialty beer designs. It's been fun working with the guys and doing a little more graphic work. With these Warped Wing projects, I'm using some of those skills of the graphic design, but I'm not approaching it like it's a graphic design project. These are works of art. It's very exciting to be a part of it and get to see, get to taste the final product at the end, how all the visions and concepts and everything kind of come together. Kohler Anderson's work has been shown internationally. To see more of her surreal creations, go to KohlerAnderson.com. Up next, we meet Pamela Glose, a Central Florida artist who says she is constantly inspired by the bright colors she finds in nature. Her inspirations take form in elaborate and colorful figures that she paints all on silk. I discovered silk painting back in 1996 when I took a college course at the University of Central Florida. I wanted to learn how to weave. I had never even heard of silk painting and it was introduced in that class and the first time I saw the dye hit the silk, I was in love. I fell hard and that's what I wanted to do. I'm a Florida resident and have been for most of my life and the things around me are fascinating. The, the Florida butterflies that we have and the, the orchids and the flowers and the wildlife and, and especially the marine life and the fish. Think, things that are colorful are just so inspiring to me, wildlife especially. And things that aren't colorful, I just make them colorful. When I first started teaching, I was teaching business. I taught business education to eighth graders for 13 years. And then I got into teaching art, and I taught art for a couple of years. And then um, I decided I wanted to do my own art and, and change things. I like to switch things around. After I got married, that's when I quit teaching, and um, I had the opportunity to start doing silk painting on my own once I discovered it. That's all I wanted to do. I had been looking for a niche in art for a long time. I have taught many people how to paint silk and um, it's always a joy to see somebody paint silk for the first time because they don't think they can and when they do they're just amazed. If you can't draw, you can still trace and I would just hand them drawings and they would trace them through the silk 
put on the gouda, put in the put on the dyes, and just they would just be floored. My lessons are all now digital, and everything that I taught in the classroom I now teach in my ebooks. One of the things about my ebooks that I believe makes them stand out is that they include video clips too. And the best way to teach someone something is to show them how to do it. Salt grain is sitting. It causes the dye to dry faster right there at that one little point. So you get these really cool looking pulling marks that look like little comets in the dye. And as I work on the rest of this piece, you don't have to go online and look for this aspect of it and that aspect of it. I give you everything you need from start to finish, from the beginning, where, where to find your supplies, uh, to how to put the resist down on the silk and the techniques and how to paint the silk and how to steam and process the silk. From beginning to end, it's all there for you. It's so wonderful to have the, the internet available and to be able to share it worldwide. I get comments from all over the world. People send me emails and make comments and, and I get to help them with their questions and it's, it's just, it's great. To check out Gloss's eBooks, go to MySilkArt.com. Arizona artist Alexi de Villiers constructs sculptures, robots, and other fun creatures out of recycled tin cans. The tin cans he uses for his projects come from ingredients in meals he cooks up every week, which he then donates to elderly homeless in Phoenix. De Villiers proves that one man's trash is indeed another man's treasure. I like to cook and I like to do art. I like to make my robots. I, I think people need to eat above all. I mean, it's, it's the main thing in life. You have to eat. And I feed elderly homeless people in downtown Phoenix. They're heavy. They're about a pound and a half each. To be able to feed the elderly homeless, I use the cans that the food comes in to make sculptures. I make dogs, sharks, and robots, and uh, cats, airplanes. These cans have a story behind them. Every single one of them either fed an elderly homeless person or a battered woman at the shelter. The more I cook and feed, the more material I have to make can art, the more I can sell to buy more food to feed more people, to buy more cans to get more money to feed more people. <laughs> My name's Alexi de Villiers. I am a recycle artist. That's a leg, that's a leg, and then that's an arm, and that's an arm. People have called my style of artwork uh, steampunk, but I never knew what that was until just recently. And I always thought it was just can art or recycled art is what I would, can, you know, recycle art, because now I'm into just everything. And the material I, I get is all junk or trash or just leftover things. I, I, I see it and I say, oh, I can make something with that. Well, I have no formal training if you, except if you'd call um, junior high shop class, high school shop class, formal training. I learned how to weld, learn how to cut wood, measure wood, use screws, use tools, sanders, drills, bores, everything, grinders. And now I, the tools I use is self-tapping screws and a drill and a pair of tin snips are the main two tools that I use. One Halloween, I said, let me make a couple of funny things and put in the yard. This is an old DMV eye checkup thing. Uh, that's a toaster. That's his mouth in there and just some teeth. And those are those Freon tanks. And then the golf clubs as feet. Uh, a lot of my art is literally functional. I make toilet paper holders and all sorts of different functional things, and this is literally a functional sawfish. And then I just started to make them you know, get smaller and smaller and smaller until I had all the leftover cans all piled up, and I just put a few together. So oh, it looks like a robot. I cut the can in half, and then it fits right on there with four points. I put a screw and a screw, and then a screw and a screw, and it looks like a little foot and a leg. And then about a year in, you know, they're all stacked in the yard. My wife says, why don't you sell some of these? So then that's where it all started. Robot sale! <laughs> these are working lunch boxes. I attach heads and feet to them. You can put your lunch in it. And all you gotta do is, they can do like a little push up and you can have your lunch. And you can hang, you can put your cell phone in his hand or you can put your iPad there. 
And then I've got, I use the, a lot of Cabbage Patch dolls. I find a lot of dolls at the Goodwills and things, and I use the Barbies. I find, I think that the coffee pots and the tea kettles are the funniest. That's just an upside down tea kettle. And I make the lamps. Uh, these are track lighting. The head is a track light and the, the fixture is mounted on the inside. So I just disassemble it and load it on top. And I buy wiring and switches. Toilet paper holder. Put your roll of toilet paper, put your air freshener. And some are just funny. I make the heads move. Maybe I'll make this one a sad face, so if you're not feeling good one day, you can just turn it around. Growing up as a kid in uh, Florida, Miami, Florida, my mother had five kids and um, one paycheck. So my mother had to stretch the paycheck a lot, but I remember how much love went into making the food and how delicious it was, and there was always plenty. You know, because she would start out with dried beans, dried rice, and she'd go get a nice giant cut of meat and cut it herself. And there was always a lot of food for a little bit of money. So my wife and I, after a bunch of years, we moved out here. And then I got a job with the state of Arizona at the Veterans Home with the Department of Defense cooking food for the retired, uh, retired uh, colonels and sergeants and stuff like that. And they taught me how to cook in large portions and how to make it small so they don't really need a knife. So I, that kind of spilled over into the cooking now for the elderly. We saw how many homeless people there are just right here in the park down the street from us. So uh, one day we thought, let's go buy some frozen meals and put them in the oven and take it over to them. And it came out to like $55 for 40 little frozen meals. So I said, you know what, I can do this much better and much cheaper. So the next week I went and bought rice, black beans, and a big old leg of pork, a Cuban tradition. And I cooked it up and I was able to make 70 meals with $50 worth of stuff. So the next week I bought, I made, I bought enough food out of my own pocket to make 120 meals. But this time, instead of going to the streets, I just went straight to the shelter. So as soon as I got there at 1030, they were all lined up ready. So I just started to pass out the meals. And four years later, we've been just doing the shelter, the, the elderly shelter. Um, I just, it's, it's fulfilling to see these people that don't have anything. They're older and the streets are tough. My future plan is I want to get one of those empty buildings downtown there and turn it into a kitchen that works Saturday and Sundays. Plus I want to hire veterans coming over now. So I want to show them, you know, I'll teach them to cook, teach them to do things like that. I'm sure they know everything, but I know you drove a tank there. Here, no one will give you a job shoveling sand, but here's, let's cook, watch, everyone eats. I like to cook and I like to do art. I like to make my robots. So I can keep cooking and keep making art and it just keeps going in a circle. These cans have a story behind them. Every single one of them came from tragedy, but then it, it's trying to alleviate some of the tragedy in these people's lives. So, you know, they get away from their abusive husband at the, at the shelter, they have a nice hot meal, those cans come to me, and then I feed elderly people that don't have anything. So when you buy it, now you have a good story. This is Winston. You like Winston? I love Winston. I okay. Want to buy it. All right, he's all yours. We'll just take this and okay. go on my way. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. To learn more, visit Fishlips on Facebook. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.
funding for Curate. The Arizona Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society member Eleanor Light. And by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on 8. For more information, call 602-496-8888.